Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 78, Germany Prepares for War Part 1, Challenges. This week a big thank you goes out to Simon, Paul, and Matt for their support by becoming a member. They get access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special member-only episodes released roughly every month. You can head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more. I would also like to thank listener Jens, whose name I hope I am pronouncing correctly, for their donation. I'm sorry if I got your name totally wrong. Over the next seven episodes, we'll be focusing on topics around Germany in roughly the last three years before the start of the war. The first three will be focused mainly on economic t- discussions, which would be absolutely critical as Germany prepared for the military confrontation that Hitler and others were planning to create. As with all of these episodes revolving around the German economy, I have to give a shout out to Adam Tooze and his work The Wages of Destruction, The Making and Breaking of the Nazi Economy. I highly recommend it. Then the second three episodes will focus on the German preparations among the Luftwaffe, Kriegsmarine, and then among their land forces. Then the seventh episode will be dedicated to the events of Kristallnacht, which was just another in a long series of anti-Semitic actions, not necessarily by the German government, but certainly supported by it. When looking at the German economy in the back half of the 1930s, which is our topic for today, the dominant factor is absolutely rearmament. Spending on the military both directly in the form of armament manufacture and indirectly in the form of transportation and other infrastructure would be the driving factor behind almost all economic decisions in Germany. To put things in perspective, by 1938, the spending on the Wehrmacht in the forms of goods and and the usage of services within Germany accounted for about 80% of the German economy. This was felt to be absolutely necessary as other nations were also increasing their spending with France and Britain, for example, massively expanding their own rearmament efforts starting in that year. These new rearmament efforts were almost entirely in response to German efforts that had started earlier in the 1930s, so really Germany had nobody to blame but themselves. The continued expansion of the rearmament campaigns caused some serious problems because the German efforts required not just a huge amount of the sort of domestic production of just about every kind of commodity, They also required imported goods, especially for items that were simply unobtainable in Germany, rubber and oil being at the top of that list. Because of the needs for these imports and the drastic reduction of exports, Germany would have some serious foreign currency issues that they would have to solve. There were actions that the government could take to delay the problem and to reduce its impact, but if German spending continued along the path that it was on in 1938, there was only one possible long-term solution, expansion. In this episode, we will chat about the economic situation in Germany before 1936, uh, which would be the year that the second four-year plan would be introduced by the German government. The plan was necessitated by, and in answer to, various shortcomings that were very apparent within the German rearmament efforts by 1935, when they had really only just gotten going. The various rearmament efforts of the 1930s never occurred in a vacuum. They interacted with one another and with international events. 1935 and 1936 were years where events began to quickly shift in many ways. Italy would invade Ethiopia. The Spanish Civil War would start. Events would escalate in China, and Germany would begin to openly rearm. This period of increased tension would eventually prompt Britain and France to also begin to increase their military spending. The Soviet Union would also during this entire period be seen as a major threat, with efforts to modernize the Soviet economy proceeding at a worrying pace, at least if you were another nation in Europe. All of these events would feed off of one another to create a kind of feedback loop. When Germany announced its rearmament, their most likely enemies were about as militarily weak as they had been since 1918. But then as those other nations began to increase their spending due to German spending, then Germany felt like they needed to spend more. Germany spending more would then prompt others to increase their spending, and up, up, up it goes. Where it stops, nobody knew. This would cause for a bit of a confusing history when you look at this time period. Because if you look at almost every nation in Europe that was joining in this rearmament frenzy, there was a series of rearmament plans that were constantly escalating, 
starting out on an annual basis before changing even to like month to month later on. Of course, the amount of money and material involved in these efforts were not just being created by a Star Trek replicator. And every time adjustments were made, additional funding had to be found to purchase the material and pay for more hours for more workers in the factories. Each nation would handle such challenges differently, and Germany was no exception. When it came to the German leadership, you know, Hitler did not care at all about the details. Hitler was always of the opinion that the economy was just a concept that existed strictly as a tool to be wielded by the leaders of the nation and towards that nation's goals. In the case of Germany in the 1930s, he would therefore say that the economy simply existed as a thing to allow for the military expansion and conquest to happen. This would become very evident in any private conversations about the economy after about mid-1936, at which point in time he clearly believed he was preparing the nation for war in the very near future. If that was the economic sort of path of choice, then there were some changes that had to be made to the German economy. The first was general autarky, or general self-sufficiency in many raw materials, especially as many as possible which would prevent Germany's eventual enemies from being able to take advantage of holes in the German supply chain, which had been such a huge problem during the First World War. The second was that large portions of the German economy would need to begin to shift over to the arms industries and into rearmament-associated directions. The third, and the ways in which those things would be possible, would be through greater government control. This increase in government control of the German economy would be an important theme throughout the last years before the war. This control was not just used to determine what was produced and the prices that would be charged for it, but was also critical to decide how to allocate and use the resources that were constrained within the economy, with the government using its power to decide how limited resources were allocated and how crucial imports were used. This is again something that was happening in most nations at this time with increasing government control being an important part of sort of the rearmament process. For example, we discussed the French economy several episodes ago, and they would proceed with rearmament in a more free market structure, like they would make a choice against government control, which was a different path than what Germany would pursue. But it was one that the French government felt was best for the French economy. In London, different choices would be made, which we will discuss in future episodes. For Germany, the second four-year plan announced in 1936 would be the final decisive shift towards sort of their choices about where government control played in the economy. And it would also move them far away from the free market system that had been used in Germany since the end of the First World War. The second four-year plan would be the next in a lengthy series of rearmament plans and efforts made by the German government and military during the interwar period. During the 1920s, they had been a bit more covert with their efforts, and during that time it was more about laying groundwork for future expansion and not the expansion itself. But they believed that at some point in the future, the restrictions placed on the German military by the Versailles Treaty would be removed, and they would be ready. In its most simple form, these preparations were just paper plans, but there were far more complex projects as well, like the secret testing and production done on various military technologies in Russia during the 1920s. Many of these efforts were eventually formalized under an economics staff, which was created in the Reichswehr in 1926. In the early 1930s, another set of plans were made, with new plans to begin to expand the Reichswehr beyond its Versailles limits. All of this planning was done before Hitler came to power, which if anything just accelerated the plans that had been created. However, the pre-Hitler plans were in many ways superseded by much more lofty rearmament schemes that required different structures to actually achieve them. But they do show that there was a planning history within the German military for the day when rearmament would begin, and that included, you know, economic discussions. And it's not something that only occurred after Hitler took power in 1933. It would be the Nazi government that would put those plans into action, though, throwing off the restrictions of Versailles just a few years after they came to power. The decision about when a war was expected to begin was critical when making choices about rearmament, and in this area the German leaders would make a critical mistake. Everything we discuss in these German rearmament episodes will be decisions based on the idea that the war was inevitable in the near future, but it was probably not going to happen until the early 1940s. For much of the 1930s, 1943 was seen by Hitler as the last possible year to start the war, 
because it would be at that point that the Western democracies would begin to decisively overtake German armament efforts. Guessing the start time for a war was critical, because during the early years of rearmament, often the most important thing that money and time was being invested in was actually not military equipment, but all of the infrastructure around rearmament. Facilities, worker training, development of new processes and materials, optimizing production lines, and other more generic economic infrastructure were all important during those opening phases. Or as R.J. Overy would say in War and Economy in the Third Reich, quote, Indirect rearmament between 1936 and 1939 was in many ways more important than the direct production of military equipment because it was designed to expand the productive economy and trained labor force for the much larger military programs ordered by Hitler in the 1940s. End quote. This made decisions about the date of the war important, even years in advance because that would dictate when it was best to shift all resources directly to armament production. The fact that the war then started in 1939 presented an interesting problem for Germany, because even though Germany was the one that would cause the events that would result in the war, they were doing so before their own rearmament efforts were complete. Now this fact was not unknown to German leaders, far from it, and we'll certainly discuss this later this year in more detail during the episodes before the invasion of Poland. But from an economic and rearmament perspective, the invasion of Poland was a risk. A risk taken on the belief that the Western nations were still simply too unprepared militarily. It would not formally commit to the defense of Poland. It was a risk based on the calculations that the response from London and Paris would be much more like the Munich crisis and less like total war. Obviously, these calculations would, in September 1939, prove to be incorrect. This left the German rearmament machine in a position where it could provide support for shorter campaigns where material could be stockpiled over a period of time and then stock rapidly ran down over a few weeks of intense operations, but it was not capable of long campaigns that would become the hallmark of the later years of the war. The German economy would eventually get there and would shift into the kind of total war mentality that was required and would also have access to the kinds of raw materials needed to make it a reality, but all of that would take several years. Not all of this should or could be blamed on the decisions made by the government or military, you know, in the mid to mid-late 1930s, and this series of episodes will be primarily concerned with the simple fact that Germany in the late 1930s did not have the resources or production capacity to meet its lofty military requirements, no matter what the exact timescale was. It could produce a lot of weapons, and it certainly would. But those resource problems within the confines of Germany as it existed in, say, early 1939 would become a serious problem and would eventually grind rearmament to a halt if there was not a way to fix it. And really, they could only do that through geographic of, you know, the late 1930s would have its own set of problems. It was only where it was because so many other problems with that German economy had mostly been solved over the course of the 1930s. Early in the decade, Germany was coming out of the effects of the Great Depression, just like every other nation, and there was a large number of people who were unemployed. Unemployment was a major topic of our episodes around Germany in the late 19th, in the early 1930s and the transition from the Weimar Republic to the Hitler-led Nazi dictatorship. When the Nazi government took power, they would put in place programs that had already been mostly outlined and were about to be implemented by the previous governments, with these programs primarily being work creation efforts. The goal was simply to get as many people as possible to work as quickly as possible through a series of public works programs, and, but they were not completely successful for reasons that are a bit too complicated to get into here. But you can refer back to episode 28, where we spent an entire episode just on work programs put in place after 1933. The conversations about the Nazi government and unemployment are complicated by the political stances it took on some issues. For example, the relationship between women in the workplace where official government policy was always designed to try and move more women back into the traditional family-oriented role. In that case, it was employment and economic policy coming up against population policy, with government incentives created to try and get more people married and get them to create more babies. This would actually end up being too popular, and the benefits were later reduced because too many people were taking advantage of them, which I I guess is good, I guess? During these and other efforts, the Nazi government would work closely with many industrialists and leaders within the German economy, 
The idea was that it was more important to get the economy to recover as quickly as possible by whatever could be done immediately, with the topic of government control and proper Nazi policies that generally were kind of anti-capitalist being put on the list of future concerns. This would prove to be somewhat successful, and the overall living standards in Germany would improve along with other economic indicators, although this living standards would quickly stop increasing out of concern that they were going to cause inflation. During this time, business leaders worked closely with the government, with many of those leaders having been active supporters of the destruction of the Weimar system of parliamentary democracy. Their reward for this support was an increase in overall business assets and (laughs) sort of income, and most importantly, governmental protections against worker actions. One of the topics that I found quite interesting when reading about German rearmament efforts compared with those of other nations, particularly France and Britain, and something I'd not previously thought about too much, is that due to how the Nazi party took power, and then their actions after they took power, there is never any real discussions about workers in Germany during this period. In other nations, the socialists or or communist parties or movements or other more moderate leftists and other such political groups had not been so thoroughly destroyed like they were in Germany. An important part of the rearmament process in those other nations was to maintain the relationships between the government, the business leaders, and the workers. In general, the workers were willing to make some wage and hour sacrifices, but only up to a certain point, which was the same for business owners <laughs> around profits. They were able, they were willing to make some cuts on profits to some level, but there was a limit. And so there was a constant tug of war that was often eventually resolved only by increased government control and often action in favor of the employers. By 1936, that control already completely existed in Germany, and there was almost no concern about any working class action or about worker relations. The working class had already been robbed of any agency during the first years of Nazi rule, and so when it came time for plans to be put in place to move into full rearmament, there were some concerns about general popular sentiment, but that could be countered by propaganda if they needed to. But there was nothing like the conversations about workers and their place within their rearmament efforts like there would be in London and Paris. This relationship between the various groups within society and the position of workers and their political and societal power is important to remember, both now as we discuss events in Germany and then also in a few months when we have similar conversations about the British rearmament efforts. For the Germans, the point of conversation that would have to be constantly revisited was the relationship between the rearmament efforts and imported materials. In April 1936, Hermann Goering was put in the position of Special Commission for Foreign Exchange and Raw Materials. As a reminder, foreign exchange is all of the currency, gold, or other items that can be exchanged with other nations to pay for imports. In this new position, Goering was given a tremendous amount of power, which in the following years he would take full advantage of to enrich himself. But from the start, his goal was clear, to ensure that military preparations continued without being hindered by raw material issues. Precisely what those preparations were, and specifically the number of items that were necessary, would constantly shift over time. The mid-1930s were a period when the definition and composition of Wehrmacht units, Luftwaffe air squadrons, and every other military unit was constantly in flux, just like everywhere else. For example, the role of the tank in the future Wehrmacht was a point very much up for discussion during these years, which would of course cause other discussions about what made the ideal tank, and what German industry should design and build. Along with this, the German general staff was beginning to shift their operational plans based on future expected capabilities, including that of armored units. After about mid-1935, plans for future campaigns began to resemble pre-First World War large-scale offensives utilizing new technology to move even faster and deliver the kinds of knockout blows that had eluded the previous generation. Within those operations, men like General Beck and those who supported a more dispersed armor sort of setup within the German military, and those like Heinz Guderian who supported armor concentration, disagreed on kind of the specifics of how armored units should be grouped and concentrated, but they did not disagree on their existence. Now, this episode is certainly not the place to untangle the complicated web of pre-war German armor doctrine, but how tanks would be grouped and and used did have serious ramifications on the tanks that should be designed and built. The plans as of April 1936 were to have 41 total army divisions. That's 36 infantry, 3 armored, 1 mountain, and a cavalry brigade. 
all of which needed to be ready for operations by 1939. This number would be increased to a strength of 78 divisions in time of war, uh, with additional reserve divisions activated. Along with the flashy items required to make all of this a reality, like tanks, of which each armored division would need about 1,800, there were also all kinds of other things that need to be built for each division. For example, each infantry division required 500 trucks, 390 smaller vehicles, about 400 motorcycles. And even with these numbers, you know, huge numbers of horses were also required for transport and artillery hauling. However, the vehicles that would need to be built were just a tiny proportion of what total German rearmament spending would require. During the initial estimations during 1936, the plan was for these vehicles to only be about 5% of total spending, massively outweighed by more traditional weapons like infantry weapons, you know, artillery, just ammunition, which would take up about a third of the budget. German vehicles were even lower in spending than German fortification efforts, primarily on the West Wall fortification system, which was planned to take about 8.7% of spending during the four years after 1936. But just to emphasize again, all these numbers were very much in flux and constantly expanding so rapidly that it's hard to draw too many conclusions from a single snapshot. Just a few months after those numbers that I just provided, of 41 total army divisions and and three armored divisions, each with 1,800 tanks, things instantly changed. The plans for the Wehrmacht expanded. It included several additional fully motorized infantry divisions, while at the same time, the exact composition of armored divisions was reworked, and their tank complements were increased by 500. This type of flux would continue, with the overriding mandate being to have the Wehrmacht ready for war within four years, but the division, the exact definition of what ready meant continued to change. To support these efforts, in September 1936, a public announcement was made by Hitler that the economy would be geared entirely to rearmament, an announcement that would have consequences. To move the economy over to rearmament, and then to make enough equipment to support an army of roughly 4 million men over the span of 4 years, would mean that the number of factories and other pieces of German industry dedicated to armaments would have to be massively expanded. Existing facilities would have to be updated and switched over to arms production, new factories would certainly have to be built. This would also require the training of a huge new workforce, altering the balance of employment within Germany. All of this was completely accomplishable. But there was a nagging question. After all those changes were made, after all those men were equipped, what happened? Industry could switch back to consumer goods, but then a large amount of money would have been wasted. But if they were to stay focused on arms production, they had to be doing something. They could not just have production capacity sitting idle. That is, unless the armament campaigns continued, in greater numbers maybe, and into the future almost indefinitely. But to support such continued production, the only possible recourse was war. There simply would not be the money or resources to continue in any other way. There was also the fact that the best time to go to war is immediately after rearmament is complete. Any delay just gives your enemies time to catch up and provides time for the items that were just built to be outclassed. Among the German general staff, the situation was clear, with one memorandum stating, quote, shortly after completion of the rearmament phase, the Wehrmacht must be employed. Otherwise, there must be a reduction in demands or in the level of war readiness, end quote. The core problem, though, at least from the economic perspective, was how to make rearmament happen in the first place, and for that, the problem was one of money and foreign imports. Many of Germany's money problems could be traced back to the fact that Germany had never devalued their currency from its position on the gold standard. Refusing to devalue made German exports very expensive and unattractive, but it made imports seem quite cheap and it also contained inflation. If you remember, these issues were the same concerns that caused France to refuse to devalue for so long during the early 1930s, before eventually in the summer of 1936, Leon Blum, as the leader of the Popular Front government, would finally implement a policy of devaluation, something that was probably long overdue for the French economy. But critically, within that movement for French devaluation, There were agreements with both the British and American governments that when the devaluation occurred, there would not be any economic retaliation by those other nations. This devaluation allowed for the French economy to in many ways rejoin an international economy that had moved on past them after the problems of the Great Depression. There were some within Germany that had been pushing for similar actions for Germany, 
Goering would commission some German economic experts to evaluate the German economy and deliver their recommendations on what should be done in the future to ensure continued growth and the ability to meet rearmament expectations. He was particularly interested in the ongoing issues with foreign exchange and the balance of payment issues that German rearmament was causing. One of the recommendations that would be made out of this effort was that Germany essentially do what the French were about to do, which was devalue their currency to improve exports and then loosen up some of the strict structures of foreign exchange availability that had been implemented by the government to ensure that imports were available and were being funneled into their rearmament efforts. But there was a problem with this plan. If the German government wanted to proceed with devaluation, they would need to gain the support of at least Britain and France to ensure that they did not take protectionary reactions against German goods. Even in 1936, so before Anschluss, before Munich, relations between Germany and those other nations were not what they had once been. To try and ensure support from those nations, the report recommended some actions that might have to be taken to gain acceptance from London and Paris. These estimations, mostly for German domestic political changes, were probably not very well founded. While relations had deteriorated by 1936, it's very likely that any economic discussions between Germany and the other nations would have been likely to succeed, or at the very least, every nation would have come into those discussions wanting them to succeed. Instead, the contents of the report were more based on what the author wanted the German government to do, with the author being uh, then Oberbürgermeister of Leipzig, Karl Gordeler, who wanted several important policy decisions of the previous years revoked, particularly around the German government's relations with the church and German Jews. Gordeler would go on to participate in various plots against Hitler, including the events of July 1944, for which he would be executed, but this document that he wrote in 1936 to try and convince the German government to enter into these negotiations and make these political changes was really just a bit of wishful thinking, I guess. In some ways, none of this mattered, though. Because while discussions were still ongoing, and even with the leaders of the Reichsbank in favor of devaluation, the likelihood of devaluation never really got above, you know, very low. There were two problems. First, the French decided to devalue, as I mentioned earlier, which made German devaluation less impactful. And second, because if Germany devalued, then we'd almost certainly have to take some at least temporary spending cuts, especially on armaments, while the economy recalibrated and German exports started to flow again. Eventually, the decision around devaluation in the course of the German economy would bubble all the way up to Hitler, which is somewhat exceptional because, again, wasn't big on economics. In his eventual statement, he would make it clear that economic policy was far from his most serious concern, saying, quote, The nation does not live for the economy, for economic leaders, or for economic or financial theories. On the contrary, it is finance and the economy, economic leaders and theories, which all owe unqualified service in the struggle for the self-assertion of our nation, end quote. The general thrust of Hitler's opinion was that raising exports was not the answer to Germany's problems, and so devaluation was pointless because its greatest impact would be to make German goods more competitive on the international market. He would then go on to state that, quote, The job of the Ministry of Economic Affairs is simply to set national economic tasks. Private industry has to fulfill them. Either German industry will grasp the new economic tasks, or else it will show itself incapable of surviving any longer in this modern age, end quote. So there, Hitler is directly threatening the independence of industrialists, saying if you can't do this, we'll take it over, we'll being the government, and we'll do it ourselves. Goering's interpretation of all of this, supported by some of the words that Hitler would use in his full statement, was that the economy from that point forward, which was in September 1936, should proceed as if war were always around the corner. That meant that no sacrifice from the people was too high, no demand from the government unwarranted if the results were that goals were met, and so the German economy would continue doing what it had been doing, with rearmament monopolizing any available foreign exchange and the rest of the economy making do with what was left. Government control was tightened. For example, Goering would eventually order that all private property that could be used for exchange, so for example, any francs or pounds or dollars or gold, would be confiscated by the government for its use. With the decision not to devalue or to make any real changes to this export situation, the only option was to double down and find a way to use available resources as efficiently as possible, resulting in the second four-year plan, which we will discuss next episode.